GDPR is complex. GDPR is complicated. I don't understand GDPR. Yes, these are the statements people often associate with GDPR. But it doesn't have to be like that. GDPR can be easy peasy. Yes, GDPR made easy peasy. It's possible. And that's what our guest Jamal Ahmed does. Jamal is one of the leading privacy advisors and privacy coaches in the world. And he is going to be here with us. And we are going to talk about GDPR made easy peasy. And especially the focus on how do you brand yourself? How do you find a job? And what it does it take for you to find a good job? Is branding essential? Let's go and talk to Jamal. Hello, and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast with Punit Bhatia. This is the podcast for those who care about their privacy. Here, your host, Punit Bhatia, has conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas, and opinions relating to privacy, data protection, and related matters. Be aware that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not legal advice. Let us get started. So here we are with Jamal, the easy peasy GDPR guy. Welcome, Jamal. Thank you, Puneet. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to have you. So you say the GDPR is easy peasy. So when you think of the GDPR, what's the one word that comes to your mind? Broad. It's very broad. broad. Yeah. Very broad. That, that, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. The GDPR is very broad. And this is a lot of the reason why individuals, businesses struggle is because it's not very prescriptive. It doesn't give you the detail. It doesn't say if X, do Y, or if not Y, do Z. It gives you the broad principles, the frameworks in which to operate. And interpreting that, understanding the nuances of that, that's where people like me and you add value to the clients with our wealth of experience, with the uh, training, the coaching, the further study, the communities, the other professionals we're networking with based on all of the understanding of what the law requires, what is the actual business objective, and how can we help the business meet their objectives compliantly, respectfully, and ethically, that's where we add the value. And that's one of the great things about the GDPR is because if it was very prescriptive, it would only work in certain cases. So let's say you have an airlines company. The way an airlines company works is completely different to how a uh, restaurant uh, with 300, uh, 300 chain restaurant works. So if you made it very prescriptive, although it might apply to the airline, it wouldn't actually apply to the restaurant chain. So the GDPR recognizes that. So they've kept it broad on purpose to allow for businesses to take accountability to make the right decisions and do what's reasonable to protect people's personal information. Absolutely. I think keep it reasonable and apply it to a context. That's where it adds value. If it was binary, one plus one is two always, then we would have artificial intelligence coded uh, robots and they would give you GDPR advice. It won't be <laughs> exactly. so relevant we'll for, for all of us careers. to be in business. Yeah, we'd be looking for other careers, wouldn't we? Yeah, we will need to look for other careers. You know, when we... that, no, at the same time, if, if we wasn't required to use our minds to solve complex problems, I don't think either of us would be interested because we're not here no. just to tick boxes and follow processes. We thrive on solving complex challenges. And with your extensive experience with all of the projects that you've managed and some of the other things that you've shared with me, I know that's what we love. We love that challenge. We need that fulfillment. And that's why we love privacy so much. And that's why we're so passionate about helping other people is we want people to come and add value using everything they've done, all of the soft skills, all of the theory, all of the actual legalese, bring it all together and provide pragmatic solutions that help businesses to meet their objectives, but more importantly, respect people's right over their personal information. Absolutely. And I think when we talk about privacy profession, people don't associate branding with it. They see it as legal profession lawyers typical uh, and you would not see them in the branding space the marketing space but end of the day we are all entrepreneurs we are all professionals and we all need to attract clients and that's where or position ourselves and that's where branding comes in what's your view on branding and how do you answer questions like this like saying why do I need to brand? Is it important? Yeah, first of all, I think personal branding is so underrated, especially in our industry. And if you want to stand out, if you want to make a difference, if you want to get hired hunted for the best projects, for the best roles, even if you don't want to start your own business and get your own uh, consultants, it's very important somebody recognizes you as the go-to person, as the person that can solve their problem. There's so many people in gray suits that do the same thing day in, day out. Um, you, you know, you can stand in the city of London and bank and you want all the difference between who's who. You can go into a law firm and if everybody's the same, then it doesn't make a difference. But people want to work with people they know, people they like and people 
people they trust. How is somebody going to know you? How is somebody going to like you? And how is somebody going to trust you and pay you the big bucks or give you the most exciting projects if they don't feel compelled that you are the best person that can solve that specific challenge for them? And the way we, we, we kind of go around answering those challenges so people know that we are the best person to help them find the solution is to focus on working on our personal brand. And personal branding isn't just about, you know, going on social media and doing a dance on TikTok, right? That, that's not what Pia and I are talking about. What we're talking about is who are you? What do you stand for? What's different about you that makes you outstanding from everyone else? And unless you're outstanding, then nobody's going to notice you and nobody's going to come to you. You're just the same as everyone else. And it's one of those things that uh, we, we, we often have conversations about. People think that if they go and do a certification program, they've got the four letters after the name and Ooh, someone's going to give me a job. But it, it just doesn't work like that. Why should they give you a job over all the other people who have got certifications? Some people might have more experience than you. Some people might have no experience. Some people might have a legal background. Some people might have a technical background. But why you? you the, the, having this certification, especially in 2023, is nothing amazing. It, it might put you ahead of other people. But what you find is that there are more and more people taking the certification every month. And that's your competition. The only thing that's going to separate you from everyone else is the personal branding. And that's one of the things we actually focus on on an accelerator program is the personal branding aspect. And you'll see a lot of my mentees, they're talking about their takeaways, they're uh, adding insights, they're offering stuff. And that's all focusing on the personal brand. And that's what leads them to get recruiters or hiring managers, sending them messages on LinkedIn, say, hey, there's this great opportunity coming up. Would you be interested? And they never have to apply for a job. If they just stuck to doing what everyone else does, they probably go somewhere apply for 100 jobs hopefully they get 10 callbacks and they may or may not get an interview they don't know because they haven't done anything to show why the company can't afford not to have you on their team and that's what we want to create and it's very easy to do that with personal branding what are your thoughts on personal branding Puneet? well for me branding is about differentiating you or positioning you maybe not differentiating but saying who you are what you are capable of what you can do and what do you stand for like say somebody wants consulting from me or you well if i go and there's no trace of me on social media and you on social media or anywhere else how do i know jamal or punit what do i stand for what does he stand for how does he speak what does what are his views on privacy why does he believe in what what he believes if they go and they can find some traces, some elements, maybe a book, maybe a video, maybe an audio, maybe a podcast, maybe anything, then they can say, ah, oh, this is the person, let me hear. And privacy is such a, I won't say complex, but such a beautiful field that you need to see if you resonate with person. There's so many people and you resonate with one and you don't resonate with the other one. You need to find the person who works with it. And the beauty of privacy profession is you ask five privacy professionals and they can give you six inputs because one of them will say you can do this or that while maybe four good ones probably will say do this hopefully otherwise you'll have 10 advices 10 inputs so in that beautiful field you want to know what kind of a person this is so it allows you to position and maybe brand yourself maybe if you are in a job and you don't have any plans to change and you will retire with the same company let's hope so then it's okay you can stay there but then also you have that personal gratification and personal positioning. So branding for me is positioning who you are and what you stand for. It doesn't have to be, as you said, being on social media, being in videos and all every day talking about uh, GDPR. It's about taking stance, taking position. For example, uh, if someone follows me, they know I don't talk about fines because that's not the way I see privacy. I see privacy as an enabler, privacy as something that creates trust. So I will usually not be posting, oh, there's a 100 million file, there's a 300 million fine. But that's not what I crave for attention on. I crave attention for privacy can be used to create a trust cycle. How do you create trust? How do you create culture? How do you govern? So for me, it's about positioning. It's about bringing yourself where you are. And that's how I think you also define branding. And most people confuse branding with putting yourself excessively into the media and talking maybe crap. But you don't have to talk crap. You have to talk relevance and talk about who you are. If it doesn't fit with your personality, so be it. Don't do it. I think what you said there is uh, super valuable. And for anyone that's listening, uh, they just need to pay it very close attention to the words that you're sharing uh, about how that will help them to differentiate from everyone else. And one thing you mentioned there, Puneet, that was really interesting, was you said, even if you plan to stay with the same company for the rest of your life or until you retire, branding is still important. It's not just about looking for new roles. It's not just about winning clients. 
It's about having credibility, like your self-esteem, your confidence. Let's say you're a privacy pro in a multinational company. There's hundreds of people that work with you. Privacy question comes up. They might not even know who to go to because they don't know who you are. They just know there's a privacy department. Oh yeah, privacy compliance, let's stay away from them, which is often the culture. But if they know who you are, if they trust who you are, if they see that you're contributing, if they see that you have credibility, if they see you have some kind of charisma, they're going to be open to having those conversations with you. And both you and I know the earlier we get involved in those conversations, the easier it is for us to work with the business to drive them towards a more efficient and effective outcome that gets that trust, that gets that buy-in from stakeholders, that helps them to meet their business objectives, as well as avoiding the fines. And what you've said the, about, uh, you don't talk about fines, Puneet, is very admirable because what you'll see is by going and talking about a fine that everyone else knows about, doesn't make you outstanding. It doesn't contribute to your personal mm -hmm. brand because just, just like this week, we've had how many people on LinkedIn, thousands of posts I've seen already about the uh, Facebook or the Meta find uh, issued by the DPA. Neither me nor Punit has spoken about that because we don't need to. It makes it the same as everyone else. What we will do is we will go and add our flavor and our insights the moment we decide to talk about this. But right now, everyone's saying the same thing. We want to be different. We want to be outstanding. We want to differentiate our personal brand. So we're going to find our time. There's no benefit in repeating the same information everyone is giving without adding value, without adding insights and without adding your take on it. And by adding your take, your insights, that's where the value comes in. And that's where people see who you are. And that's what helps you drive forward your personal brand. And whether you're working, looking to gain clients, whether you're looking to gain a new job or a promotion, or whether you're looking to stay in house, we all need that credibility. We all need that know, like, and trust factor. Otherwise, we become ineffective. We can't perform our roles. If we can't perform our roles, we start getting filled with self-doubt. The more self-doubt and self-negative thoughts we have, then we have imposter syndrome. And then that can lead to stress and other physical problems, and it can manifest itself in other areas of our life. And we want to make sure we protect ourselves. We want to make sure we have strong mental health. We want to make sure we deliver and serve our clients well. But we also have a good quality of life. We feel good about what we do. We feel great about what we do. Not what we sometimes hear people are, oh, dread, I have to go to work. Somebody <laughs> might ask me a question. I don't know how I'm going to answer it. I don't want to talk up in the meetings because I don't know, you know, they don't listen to me when I say anything anyway. So what's the point? Like who wants to live a life of mediocrity? If you want to live a life of mediocrity, then that's great. You're probably wasting your time on this podcast. But if you <laughs> want to be great, if you want to excel, if you want to thrive, if you want to be like Puneet, then all you have to do is just show up. And it takes a little bit of effort and a little bit of thinking and a little bit of positioning, once you understand what your why is, the house will come for themselves. Exactly. And I think regarding the being in the same company and branding, I have a very good example that I'm reminded of. I had a person whom I was talking to, a DPO, and she was saying, uh, so it's a she, uh, already personal data revealed, but she was saying, I'm not taken seriously. So what I started to do is initially when I was made DPO, nobody was taking me seriously and everybody was avoiding it. So she started to dress up really like a witch every day. <laughs> and then when she comes to office, everybody said, oh, that witch. And then, but her behavior was completely opposite. So while she dressed up as a witch, she was completely normal, very friendly, outgoing, talking to people, having conversation. And very soon she developed a reputation. Oh, that's a privacy thing. Oh, you need to go to I go and talk to that witch. So nobody remembered the name. They started to remember the name as witch and they were coming to her. So what she inadvertently did is personal branding in a company, but getting people taking, putting the elephant in the room. She's a witch. Let me dress up as witch. Let me be known as a witch but let me solve the problem. So you go to the witch and the problem is solved. What a beautiful way. And that's basically branding we are talking about. It's the same thing people are saying, you mentioned a very important point saying, searching for a job, you get a four letters, four alphabets, you won't get a job, sorry. The job is based on who you are, what you stand for. And of course, CIPM, CIPP, CIPT are acronyms, which allows you or even FIP says, yes, you are qualified, but then so what? What do I do with that? Some of the people are PhD and then uh, they are researchers and they, they can do a lot of stuff. But can you help companies? That's what people are after. And that leads me to another question, which people who ask me and I'm sure they ask you also, how do I find the job? I mean, there are many answers, but what do you tell them? So the first thing I say is it's not about finding a job. It's about finding the right fit. What kind of company do you want to work for? And what do you actually want to provide? A lot of the time people look at what can I get? Can I get 100K salary? Can I get uh, 60 days off? Can I get all of these private health benefits? Can I get access to the gym? And everyone's focusing on what can I get? Forget about what you can get. Start focusing on what you can give. Where do you add the value? 
and the jobs will come to you. Like I tell people and the people that sign up for my accelerator program, they don't believe me at the beginning when I tell them recruiters will be approaching you for jobs. But then when they actually start implementing all of the things that I'm talking about, personal branding being a key aspect of it, they focus on the value they bring. People be like, don't let that person out the building until they've signed the contract. Like that's the position you want to be in. And the only way you can get in that position is by focusing on the value you bring. And every single person listening here, you have something unique inside you. You have something that you do better than everyone else. Everyone has a unique giftedness zone. And all you have to do is focus on your excellence, what you do better than everyone else. And that becomes the tip of the iceberg of where you start bringing in that value. That's the thing you focus on your personal brand. And then just like underneath the surface, you have all of the other soft skills. You have your certifications. You have all of the experiences that you've done. Whether it's dialectry related to privacy or not, it doesn't matter because a lot of these skills are transferable. But unless you can demonstrate how you bring that value, how you use all of that to solve the problems the business is facing and going to face pragmatically, it's all hopeless. And this is where the pragmatism comes in. This is where the personal branding comes in. This is where you showing where you add value makes you irresistible to the hiring managers. Because remember, they're going to be speaking to hundreds of people that are going to apply for these roles. They're probably going to interview about 10 on the long list, and then they might bring in three to five on the short list. What you have to understand is it's a process. And the only way you advance through the process is by showing the value you add and how that is greater than anyone else they're speaking to, regardless of your personal background, regardless of your racial or ethnic origin, regardless of anything else, but focused on the skills and the strengths that you bring and how you're using all the transferable skills that you've acquired throughout your life to really support them solving problems. Absolutely. And I think uh, what I tell them is also just to add on, I say, there are two job markets. One is the visible job market. Jobs are out in the market and you are approaching that. But there's the other market in which jobs are not published, but they have the problem, they have the pain. And if they see you solving that pain, they would automatically come to you or you can go to them. And then you find a better and a quicker fit because then you're not in the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 game. Exactly. You are directly the one-to-one -one match. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when, when I speak about this, I mentioned Pareto's law, the 80-20 rule. So like Pundit said, 80% of the roles on the market is the one that you see advertised on the job boards. But the problem is when they advertise on the job boards, it means that they've actually been through looking internally, haven't found anyone. They've spoken to their friends and other people and the recruiters, they haven't found anyone. And now they put it on the market, which means they'll get anywhere from hundreds to thousands of applicants, depending on how attractive the company and the uh, sort of role and the salaries. What's going to make you stand out from those hundreds and thousands? And in fact, why would you even want to enter that game? Because the odds are stacked against you. Why would you not rather be in the top 20% where based on your personal branding, based on the things you're engaging in, based on your network, they've actually identified you as the person who can solve their problems. And they've approached you and said, hey, we've got this opportunity coming up. We'd love to chat to you about it. Um, are, are, you, are you open to it? That's the kind of conversations you want. And that's the hidden job market. So when a job comes up, usually it's because somebody leaves or because there's been a requirement that's been identified and the headcount's about to get approved. Hiring managers don't wait for the job description to go to HR. They'll start looking internally. And the first thing they do is say, is there anyone in the company that can kind of fit this role? Or is there anyone in my network who I think would be a great fit for this? If they can't find anyone there, the next thing they'll do is they have relationships with the recruiters, right? Remember, these recruiters, they're calling them every week, asking them, taking them out to football matches, building relationships with them. Um, so they will be aware of what's happening in the company and they will already start working on these things. So they will usually get exclusive access to try and fill that role before anyone else even knows it's there. And they will focus on the candidates that they have that they don't know are great or the people they see on LinkedIn who are magnetically attracting their attention because they're talking about privacy, they're adding value, they're showing how they're taking that pragmatic approach. And then the recruiters or even the hiring manager will approach you directly with opportunities. And you don't have any competition at this point. It's just you. They might have spoken to one or two other people. They might wait to speak to you before they go to somebody else. And they can't actually go through the formal process because HR hasn't even written up the job description and posted it on those boards yet. So you are in a great position to block out all the competition by going, demonstrating the value you have, learning about the company, showing how you are a cultural fit. Again, personal branding is a big part of that. If they can see what you're like as a person, they will already be able to identify whether or not you're going to be a great cultural fit for them or not. And that's all you have to do when it comes to that position is demonstrate three things. One, you're competent to do the role that they're asking you to do. Two, you're motivated to work for that company in that specific role. And three, you're a great cultural fit. If you can do all those three things, there's nothing stopping you uh, from being made an offer there and then.
And if you can demonstrate how you're outstanding and how you bring more value than anyone else, then they will often be happy to negotiate just to make sure they secure you. Absolutely. And I think that's the same philosophy the recruiters work for. The recruiter, before they put it on their website, before they put it on LinkedIn, they get a job from one of the hiring managers and they say, ah, this one, that's the person I know. Let me check with them if they are interested in this. They do job matching themselves. Then as a side thing, they put it on the LinkedIn or wherever they put it or their website. And then, of course, they announce and collect CVs and everything. But they pay, they pay most attention to people whom they know, whom they know they are in market. And there again, those three things, they know they are competitive. They have the skills, they have the competencies, they are motivated and they will bring themselves and they will fit in. That's the thing that even a recruiter looks at. So if you brand yourself, if you position yourself and if you're known in the market, you don't have to be on social media, but if you're known with to people, that's what allows you to get the job, not searching for jobs and making applications because you make, you make applications, you're going into the heap of people and then to differentiate would be working backwards. Exactly, exactly. And it's just like, you, you, you're just clutching at straws, isn't it? Yeah. There, there's, there's no logic behind that. Indeed. And when we talk about this branding, the coaching and everything and the job seeking, then people are looking for solutions. Then they come to people like you, people like me and many others. And then most people want a ready-made solution. If it was, I would package it and sell it just like that. But it isn't. It is, has to be very personalized. I mean, package solution can be, this is the CIPPE you have to do. These are the 20 things you have to do as per the blueprint of IIPP. This is what we will tell you. And you absorb, you clear the questions. That's standardized. That's called commodity. But what you and me specialize is the personalized advice because you are different. We help you create a brand. We help you find the job. And we help you fit in, not fit in. You find where you fit in. Because it's always can do, will do, will fit. Can you do the job? If you've done the certification, mostly you can. Will you do it? That's an evaluation. And will you fit in? That's the cultural fit. So the question then is, people come for ready-made solutions. I call that teaching. Because they want to be taught a formula 1 plus 1 is 2. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist. And then there's another concept what we call in the modern world is called coaching. And there's a subtle difference between the two. People are looking for quick solutions while we are giving them the guidance to become independent guidance to grow as individuals. So can you elaborate your views on the difference between the two so that some of our audiences and your audiences would get to understand a little bit more clearly what it is, what it means? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jamal, a lot of people have this pre notion or conception that they want ready to made solutions it's like ready to eat quick fix quick solutions i get a injection and i'm corona free well that doesn't work so you still can have corona and in the same way when you're looking for solutions cippe cipm cipt or certifications are more commodity there's a prescribed syllabus you do that you appear in an exam you practice some questions and you can get through there the, the standard formula works but finding jobs, branding yourself, growing as a professional, growing your career, those are very, very specific fields. And there's no set formula. It needs to be developed. We can give, we can guide, we can give you the concepts, but then you got to implement in your own situation what fits in with your values, your dreams, your aspirations, and who you are as a person. So can you elaborate in that sense, teaching versus coaching? In my mind, the teaching is you have a CIPM course. I know what are the subjects. I will teach you that. Then uh, you do a few practice questions and you're ready for the exam. Mostly it'll work unless, of course, there are some exceptions. You are super intelligent and you don't need to be taught or you're the other extreme. And then we have to tell you four times or five times. But then video works and teaching works. But how do you differentiate between this teaching and co coaching approach? Great, great question. And uh, it's something that I see a lot of people actually struggling with. Uh, there's some people don't even know that there's a difference, uh, that there's actually coaching programs and uh, mentoring programs uh, like the ones we, me and you offer. They just think there's just this one way of doing things. And you know what the truth is? It's not their fault. It's because they go to school, they're taught a syllabus, everyone across the whole country is taught the same syllabus. And then at the end of that process, they're given an exam. Everyone's given the same exam and everyone says pass. And they're told that based on how well you do or how badly you do, your life will either be great and successful or it's going to be poor and you're going to be a loser and you probably end up uh, doing something you don't want to do, right? So this is the challenge people have is they don't know any different. 
And it's only when they start expanding their mindset, they actually understand, oh, there was that teaching and then there's actually a self-study and then there's learning with the coach and you're being mentored. What is the difference between the three? So teaching in the sense that we were speaking about, the opposite of mentoring and coaching, is where you go, you find a syllabus, you learn that syllabus, some people even memorize that syllabus, and then you go and put that onto a test to see if you've managed to uh, retain enough of that knowledge to be able to pass the test. So for example, um, you can see that there's 120 official uh, training partners that offer CIPP, CIPM, CIPT certifications across the world, right? And every single one of them um, does the same thing. You go, you sign up for a two-day program. There will be a contracted lawyer that will usually come in, read out slides to you, and then good luck, off you go. Uh, you're left to it on your own. You have the book. Some people will pick up the book. They'll read the book. They'll learn the pages of the book. Some people believe they have to memorize the GDPR and they actually go and do that. Uh, and they think that's enough. But that's not. That means you have the knowledge or you're able to regurgitate that knowledge. But that doesn't add any value. I can Google it and get the answers. I can buy the textbook and get the answers. Where, where is the value? The value is added in. How do you take that knowledge, use your critical thinking to then apply what you've discovered in a way that makes sense? And the difference between that study or that learning or that self-study of going and doing any of those basic courses compared to what me and you offer is that we actually share our knowledge. We share our skills and our experience. And we do that to help them to develop and grow so they can grow and transform into these world-class privacy professionals. You can't get that from a textbook. You can't get that from watching videos. You can't get that from having somebody read slides out to you for two days. You only get that when you work with somebody for longer than, I'd say around 12 weeks is a good good, good time to work with someone. That's enough time to develop the habits. That's enough time to get rid of all of those limiting beliefs and mindsets and really open your mind and say, this person who's already walked the path that I want to walk on is open to sharing their knowledge, their skills, their experiences, saving me from making the same mistakes they've made and giving me the quick solution, saving me time, money, and energy because they're telling me what's working and what's worked for them when the work's worked for hundreds of other people's. That's where the mentoring and the coaching comes in is it helps you save that time, avoid the mistakes that we made. We just give you everything that works in a package. Okay, it's not a ready meal. You still have to buy the ingredients and we give you the recipe. But we take you by the hand and we say, this is the path we've walked. This is what's worked. These are the mistakes we made. So avoid those pitfalls. And you know what? This is exactly what's working right now. And for anyone that wants to fast track their careers, that really wants to thrive, what they should be looking for is a mentor or a coach who can really share the knowledge, the skills, the experiences with them to help them grow and develop themselves. Because the self-study... I mean, look, one, one of the things you might have noticed recently, I get into a lot of conversations on LinkedIn, and a lot of people, they don't rate the certifications. They say, oh, it's just a multiple choice question test. Anybody can do that. It doesn't do anything. And I've met so many people who have the actual exam. They don't have the confidence. They don't have the clarity. They don't have the credibility. And they're actually devaluing the certification. But the problem is, most of those people they're describing are the people who have actually either self-studied or gone and sat on a two-day training, had somebody read the slides out to them, and somehow managed to pass an exam. Nobody's actually sat with them and explained to them the actual application of it, different ways of thinking about things. What this means in one context is gonna mean something completely different in another context. So their best thinking has got them to where they are, and their best thinking is also what's limiting them because their best thinking has only got them to where they are. They need to find somebody else who has expanded awareness for them to then expand their mind to be able to get better results. And this is one of the most valuable lessons I learned very early on when I started going on coaching programs and getting mentors. And I know we share some similar mentors uh, and coaches, but this is something that we discovered quite early on, which has really helped us to understand my best thinking is only got, has got me here. If I now want to go over there and even beyond, I can't do it on my own. I need somebody who has proven expertise. I need somebody who's already done it. Show me and teach me how it's done so then I can help and grow. And then when you get there, you might need a new mentor to move to another stage. It's, 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 life is all about expanding and growing. And if you want to stand still and you want to be mediocre, then you should be happy with mediocre results. But I truly believe every single person here has been put on this earth for a reason. And every single one of us has brilliance inside. And you need to shine. And sometimes you will need help to let that light radiate because 
of how you might have been treated in the past, because of how you might have been put down, because of some of the self-limiting decisions you might have made, because of the things that are holding you back. Sometimes people have their own worst enemy and they hold themselves back. It's because what they have what we call this fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And the fixed mindset is where somebody says, I just want to look smart. I don't want to put in the effort. I don't want people to think I don't know. So I'm not going to ask questions and I'm not going to go and put myself in a stage where I'm going to be uncomfortable because I'm quite happy here. With that fixed mindset, you never grow. And the people with a fixed mindset, they believe that intelligence is actually something that is fixed. You're born like that. You're either born smart or you're born not so smart. You're either creative or you're not creative. What they don't realize is that our brains are neuroplastic, which basically means that with enough effort, with enough practice, with enough repetition, we can create new neurological pathways. And I was recently listening to a TED talk where he says uh, that if you just commit 20 hours to one particular skill, then you can become, perform at a level of excellence. You won't get perfection. I mean, I think there's another theory that talks about you need a thousand hours or something, but that study was based on the top performing athletes in the world. If you want to get to Olympian athletic level, yes, you need that thousand hours. But if you want to get to a place where you can excel and by excel, I mean 85%, not hundred percent, that is more than enough for all of us to have thriving careers, for us to have the lifestyles that we want, for us to be able to have the self-esteem that we need and to really make a difference in the world. But that comes from having that growth mindset, willing to say, I don't have all the answers, willing to say, I don't have all the knowledge. And the biggest challenge is you don't even know what you don't even know. It's only when you go and speak to somebody like Puneet who shares a story with you, who says, I was having a discussion with somebody in this country and in this specific industry, your brain starts opening up and expanding its awareness. And the moment you start expanding that awareness by finding the right mentors, that's when the game's going to change for you. Absolutely. And I think that makes me wonder, what's your story? How did you get into privacy and how did you get into this abundance mindset? Because we ne- most of us were not aware of this abundance mindset. Most of us were not born privacy professional. So how and when did you get into these two skills, the privacy skill as well as the abundance of the mindset skill? All right. So I'll start off with the mindset first. Uh, So when I was growing up, um, we used to have this small TV. (laughs) I think we started off with a black and white TV, right? (laughs) And then eventually we got this big, massive wooden box, which which had color and you had to try in the uh, dyes. But I think on ITV, there used to be a Saturday night program by somebody called Paul McKenna. And he was a hypnotist and he used to do entertainment. He now does actually a lot of personal development stuff, and he's a great coach for anyone who wants to have some kind of great results from that. He helps people stop smoking, lose weight. He helps with um, confidence, everything. But there was this guy, he would put people to sleep. He would say, go to sleep, and he would say, when you wake up, you're going to cluck like a chicken, (laughs) or you're going to forget your name, or you're going to do whatever it is. And I was fascinated by this guy. It's like, how can you talk to people and make them do all these silly things or forget things and, and it just doesn't make any sense. So I, I started looking into hypnosis as I got a little bit older. And the more I looked into hypnosis, the more I came across a guy called Richard Bandler. And Richard Bandler came up with this thing called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, not Natural Language Processing, for anyone that's a, a IT geek, but Neuro Linguistic Programming. And Neuro Linguistic Programming basically says the way we use language has results in the way we think and therefore the results we get. And you might have heard this in memes or other places. Your thoughts become your words. Your words becomes your actions. And your actions become who you are. So that means the thoughts that we have are very powerful. And did you know, uh, it, it bamboozled me the first time where I knew that, you know what, there's actually different ways of talking to yourself. And the way you talk to yourself is going to manifest into the who you present yourself in the world with. So you could either say, ah, you know, I'm rubbish at this and reinforce that thing, that self-limiting belief, or, you know, I'll never be rich or money is evil or whatever self-limiting decision somebody might have. Or you could have positive uh, self positive decisions, positive influences. I get better and better every day. I know with enough effort, I can excel at anything. I have an abundance of stuff. Remind yourself of the things you're grateful for. So it was through my fascination with hypnosis and wanting to make my friends clap like chickens that led me to NLP. And then NLP led me to getting certified as a master NLP practitioner. I also did some Ericksonian hypnosis. And for a time, I did performance coaching, uh, which is basically where all of the personal development stuff that you see me talking about that I bring into my programs comes from. It's from my previous training, my previous uh, uh, career as a personal growth coach. The reason I stopped that was 
what I found was too many people was coming to me asking me to help them solve their problems. And I'm not somebody who wants to go and focus on your problems. Let's identify the problem because I believe a problem will identify as a problem half solved. But I don't want to dwell on the problem because then we're not moving. I want to focus on the solution. Like how great do you want to be? Where do you want to get to? And so that's why I gave up that coaching and I moved into compliance. And it was in compliance where I first came across to answer the second part of the question about privacy. And one of the things I noticed was this uh, GDPR stuff was coming out. People started mentioning it. And nobody really had a clue on what was going on. And the more I looked into it, the more fascinated I got. I even looked into it from a spiritual point of view uh, to see where it comes from, from my faith and what we say about it. And the revelations were fascinating. And I was like, wow, this is great. And, and then I said to my wife, hey, um, I'm going to give this thing a go. And at that time, um, my, my wife was pregnant. So it was the first time she'd been pregnant. We'd been married for a long time and we had fertility challenges. So here I am in this compliance role. I wouldn't say I particularly enjoyed it. Uh, I was doing a process. You know how you're doing the financial services. You run the processes. I wasn't adding much value. And I always knew that there was much more I could contribute. And I was always very keen to be able to take something from where it is and improve it or help people improve the process. And as I focused more and more on the actual regulations and how we applied in the business, they started giving me more and more responsibility. And I was like, you know what? This is great. But then what I realized is when I'm having conversations with my friends, with my families, when I'm working with charities, they're all so clueless and they're getting really poor advice. And I was like, you know what? There has to be a better way to do this. And you had all of these people coming in telling businesses, the only way you can do anything is by getting consent and GDPR is all about consent. And if you can trace your minds back into 2018, 20th to 30th of May, how many emails did you get asking you for your consent and how many of those did you ignore? If like most people, you ignored 99% of them, then 99% of businesses lost their databases. They yeah. lost their leads. They lost people who they could market to because some bad professional told them the only thing you can do is concern. Otherwise, you can't talk to people. I remember I was speaking to this one company in Sweden where they was told that their door-to-door -door salespeople have to knock on the door, give a privacy notice, get the person to sign it before they can even speak to them. Wow. I, you, you can't make this stuff up. It's just how ridiculous is this? So I was like, you know what? There has to be a better way. And that's why I set up the uh, uh, and Privacy Experts to offer pragmatic solutions to businesses who are getting poor advice otherwise we, at price that they can actually uh, afford. And it makes sense. I'm not going to go to a medium-sized business and say it's going to cost you uh, you know, half a million pounds for me to have a look at your privacy program. What we can do is do a gap analysis and focus on the bits that are priority. And that's basically what we started doing. And because I like taking this easy peasy approach, breaking things down in a way everyone can understand, it started building traction and I started getting lots of referrals and then the media started getting involved. So, hey, you know, every time we try to talk to somebody uh, on the news, they talk in too much legalese, which is not right for our viewers. The you know, average audience is like an, uh, has the comprehension of an 11 year old in, in the UK, at least anyway. Uh, we just need somebody that can speak about stuff in a way people get it. And uh, so I was like, yeah, I'm more than happy to. And that led to lots of TV interviews, radio interviews, and it helped me to really uh, further consolidate my personal brand. And then while I was doing that, uh, I had a couple of family members who was like, this stuff you're doing is great. How do we get into it? So my brother was one of my first mentees. Uh, one of my other friends, they, they were a couple of my first mentees, and they was like, what do we need to do? And I helped them land roles. So well, one of them actually runs the privacy pro uh, department for Mazars now, which is like in the top five consultancies here in the UK, big, massive French company. Um, so in a very short space of time, within two to three years, the family and friends that I mentored got into really good positions because they started taking this easy peasy approach. And on LinkedIn and other places, I'm getting bombarded every day asking for help. So I was like, you know, there comes a time where you have the knowledge, but you have to share it. And this is a great opportunity for me to contribute and give back and add value and help people really transform their lives because we need privacy professionals. And when I had my uh, children, you may or may not be aware of this. I've had three losses. So I had my first child, I uh, got took her away. Then I had twins, Noah and Isaac, and God took them away. And it took me into a very destructive cycle. And I was in a really bad place. And I thought the only way to get out of this bad place is to show up in the world and start making a difference. So I started doing privacy and charitable projects to honor their memories. And I decided, you know what? I want to see a world where every woman, every man, and every child enjoys their right to privacy 
and I'm going to be the one who is going to do everything I can to make that happen. So then when I am reunited with my children and we meet people, they can say I've had some kind of an impact on their lives and it would bring that memory back. And more recently, I've had my uh, I've had a daughter, which uh, we've been blessed with. God's allowed us to bring her home. Uh, her name is Amy. <laughs> May God bless her. And I say, look, Amy, I want you to grow up in a world where wherever you go, whoever you speak to, every woman, every man and every child on this planet, will enjoy freedom over the personal information. So let's set up the Privacy Pros Academy because if we, if I'm going to achieve the vision, oh, I can't do it by myself. Regardless of how many clients we get at Kazian, we're always going to be limited. It's going to be a drop in the ocean. So what we need to do is we need to create an army or a community or a tribe of people who buy into the same values, who have the same um, pragmatic approach. And if they don't have it, we have to help them develop that. So to achieve the vision of being able to make sure that every woman, every man and every child on the planet can enjoy the right of privacy, we have to make sure that every organization that deals with personal information is empowered to adopt honest and transparent privacy practices. How are we going to do that? Well, we can't work with every single company, but what we can do is we can put someone there or we can be associated with somebody in every single company eventually and if we work hard enough and if we make a powerful enough community, if we share this, our messaging on the podcast, on our easy peasy guys through our programs, then we can create a community of world-class professionals who will go out there and make massive impacts on their uh, businesses, on their organizations for their clients and really help us. So let me give an example of how easy this is because sometimes when I talk about it, people think it's just too much out there and then you have to break it down and say, we have a plan and it's working. So one of the... Um, we have people from the top four consultants coming and training with us. These guys, they go and work with multinational companies. So the advice they give, the solutions they're providing is going to impact millions of people around the world. The data protection council from Facebook came and trained with me, right? Facebook has about 6 billion accounts. So let's say they don't have 6 billion people. Let's just say they have 3 billion people. So the pragmatic approaches we're teaching, those practices that we're asking them to go and adopt, any changes they make that's positive, it's going to impact almost a third of the population on the globe. And that's just through one person. If we have hundreds of people, which we do now, and they work for companies all across the world, and we have this community who's always working towards achieving this vision, and we're always sharing ideas and holding each other up and helping each other grow, it's only a matter of time before we achieve that. And that's what the Privacy Pros Academy is all about. It's about helping individuals in a selfish way to be able to fulfill my vision. And it's not just my vision, it's a vision that we share in the community and everyone else that comes in. The first thing we say is, this is what we're about. If you're in uh, and you see that vision, then we'd love to have you. If you're just looking to pass an exam and look smart, then there's better options for you. Go and do something else. <laughs> and that, that's what's helped us attract the right people. And when you see people posting their takeaways, when you see them on webinars, when you see them, you can see magnetically that everyone else in the community is supporting them, giving them positive comments. And it's not just the positive times where people get behind them it's also the negative times. so whenever we have somebody who's gone and sat an exam and they haven't got the outcome they want they will come and they will share that a lot of the time people will keep that secret like i i know people who will not pass and they won't tell anyone until they pass but in our community we encourage everyone to be open it's a very safe space there's no such thing as a silly question you can ask anything we're all here to help so they'll come and say you know what i attempted this i actually didn't get the outcome i wanted and you'll have 20 30 40 people uh making them feel better about themselves, reminding them of the things they do that's good, reminding them that it just means not yet, reminding them and offering them one-to-one -one coaching or help with the specific things or breaking something down or doing a peer-to-peer -peer review session with them. How powerful is it when you have that and you know you can't fail? Even if you don't get the outcome you want on the test, it doesn't mean you fail, it just means not yet. You know there's a powerful community behind you. There's people like me and Puneet uh, who will offer you that support, coach you, train you, get you to where you are, and then hold your hand to make sure that you're being able to solve any of those problems. The thing I love most uh, is this story. So there was um, this, this this girl, um, she this privacy pro, let's call her. So she, she's part of the community. She did the training and she was looking forward to getting her first role in privacy. She didn't have actually a background in privacy. So it was she thought it was going to be a bit more challenging. And during one of the interviews, they asked her a question, which was basically related to privacy. And she was very open. She said, look, I don't know the answer, but if you give me five minutes, I'll give you the answer. So they was like, you don't know the answer, but in five minutes, you're somehow going to magically come up with the answer. Okay, we'll entertain you. So she went into the group, she asked a question, and within uh, the space of five minutes, she had about three or four different approaches, and she discussed it with them. They was like, what, what, like, where are you getting this information from? And she's like, look, I'm, when you hire me, 
you don't just get me, you get me and I'm part of this community. And there's people from all over the world with all different abilities, all different industries. And this is what you get when you hire us. So it helps to really solve those problems. And especially when you're at work and you don't have the answers, you don't have to look anywhere else. You can just come ask the community and they will support you. So you're never going to be in a position where you struggle to solve a problem. And even if it's an innovative thing that can't be solved, there will be so many people giving you different ways of looking at it based on their experience, based on their culture, based on what part of the world they're in, based on what they're familiar with. And that will really help you to come up with those pragmatic solutions to solving those complex problems. Absolutely. I think it's wonderful to hear your story and how you help people. But you also have this podcast. Can you tell us something about that podcast? Because it's also one of the highly ranked podcasts. Let me tell you about the podcast. So last at the end of last year, we looked at the top 10 episodes. And in the top 10, there was a gentleman called Puneet Bhatia who came on the podcast and shared some nuggets of golden, valuable tips for anyone who's looking to thrive in a Privacy Pros podcast. So yes, the Privacy Pros podcast is a podcast I put together because one of the things I realized is not everyone has the financial resources to be able to access some of our programs. And I, I mean, we'll, we'll put it out there. Our programs are more expensive than anyone else. Um, we are a premium provider, but you get what you pay for. So we realize that people can't access the programs. We do give scholarships to people from India and Africa. However, it's still a struggle for some people. And we want to make sure that the people in our community, the people that are actually um, interested in privacy, whether they access our programs or not, they can listen to the experts and they can get ideas, they can get tips, they can become better. And that's all it's about. Like, we're not going to be able to find a person that works in every single company. But if we can touch enough people, if we can impact enough people, we can get people to start thinking about the right ways. And sometimes the insights that people will get listening to somebody like Eduardo, uh, who wrote the actual CIPP or who, who compiled the textbook, listening to somebody like Jules Polonotsky, who I call the godfather of privacy, listening to somebody like Puneet Bhatia, with all of his amazing experiences solving problems, working in really complex uh, projects. These people are telling you all of the things that have worked for them, they're giving you their top tips, their secrets, they're giving this stuff away. It's only going to add value. So I say to my team, like this podcast, yes, it costs us a lot of money to produce and manufacture and get people's time. And we don't really, we don't take any sponsorships for it. Uh, it's because we want to keep it clean. And it's our gift to the world. It's our gift to the privacy pros. And it's anyone that's interested in privacy, come and have a listen. Get the tips on how to have a successful career in privacy, but not just learning from me, learning from some of the most brilliant minds on the planet when it comes to privacy, like Puneet. And you'll see these people on webinars, you'll see them on podcasts, uh, Debbie Reynolds, um, and there's so many people, I can't name them, so please forgive me if you're listening to this and I haven't named you. But we have some amazing guests, and I learned so much just by having conversations with them, just like I did with you, Puneet, and just like I'm learning now. We learn from each other. And this is the thing about having the abundance and the growth mindset is that, you know, you don't know everything. There's, a, there's limits to what we know. There's limits to what we don't know. But what we should identify is where our gaps are. When we know where our gaps are, then we can go and then fill those gaps. And that's basically what I look to do. I look to find guests that are going to add value that I can learn from, that inspire me, just like you. So then we can tap into your minds and unlock those secrets. And instead of making mistakes, instead of trying to figure things out on our own, we can just take that, apply it and get the results that we deserve and that we want to create the lifestyle that we want for ourselves and our families. And then also, it becomes a time when it's about giving back. Uh, and this is what really makes me and you drive forward is we're not in it for ourselves anymore. Uh, we we, we want to help people. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. It's about our legacy. It's about our contribution. And that's what drives us. And if unless you have the abundance mindset, there is no way you will be able to contribute in a way that's greater than yourself. And the moment that you start thinking about how can I add value, how can I contribute, your personal branding gets answered, your uh, the skills that you need to get answered, the certifications you need to get answered. Whatever is holding you back, you suddenly find all the answers for that because you're not focused on what's in it for me. You're focused on what can I give. And the more you focus on what you can give and how you can add value to the world, the easier all the other hows become. Yeah, I think you said it earlier also. When you know the what and why more importantly when the why is clear the how comes along but if you're focused on how to do it and don't know the why don't know the what that's where you, all the struggle comes in but that's why we say start with the reason why do you want to do it rather than with they say end in the mind end will come but first you need to know what do you want to achieve why do you want to do it what's driving you but i think yeah. like all good things the challenge is time and in this episode also 
it has time has passed like anything and all i can say is it's been a wonderful conversation having you insightful inspirational and very relevant because like you said the podcast it's about two things it's about learning and it's about growing and i don't know everything so i learn from others and i grow with others and that's what you do and we all do and then you share and when you share you get to grow as well so thank you so much for all the work you are doing the podcast the academy helping people and making an impact and continue to make privacy and gdpr easy peasy on an ongoing basis thank you so much jamal thank you so much panit you're always so kind and in fact uh, you you are one of those uh, people who are true gentlemen and people like me look up to you and i know so many of my mentees and so many people that we have in common also look up to you um so thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and share some of my thoughts with your audience i look forward to collaborating and i look forward to us helping more people together and it's been an absolutely amazing time and a pleasure to be here today thank you so much thanks for listening if you liked the show feel free to share it with a friend and write a review if you have already done so thank you so much and if you did not like the show don't bother and forget about it take care and stay safe Fit for Privacy helps you to create a culture of privacy and manage risks by creating, defining, and implementing a privacy strategy that includes delivering scenario-based training for your staff. We also help those who are looking to get certified in CIPPE, CIPM, and CIPT through on-demand courses that help you prepare and practice for certification exam. Want to know more? Visit www. fitforprivacy.com that's www.fit the number 4 privacy.com if you have questions or suggestions drop an email at hello@fitforprivacy.com at until next time goodbye